So I delivered a sermon four years ago on January 22nd, actually not the 15th, but the 22nd. Before then, uh, I participated in a um, inauguration Vespers service. This was January 19th of 2017. And um, a number of people from Middleborough and Bridgewater and surrounding communities gathered at the Bridgewater church. Um, and when it came my turn to speak, I offered these words to that sanctuary that was filled with people hurting. And here's what I said. Thank you for being here, for seeking one another's company and taking it into your hearts. This is the eve of the inauguration, a day some of us wait for with relief and hope and others with fear and protest. Like many of you, I've lived long enough to have experienced many such inaugurations. It never seems to fail. There are some presidencies which represent a complete turnover in culture in spirit and in devout belief about what is needed to make our nation prosperous and conscientious and righteous among the world's nations. We are living through such a time, I said, a time when we discover that those near to us and familiar to us are suddenly standing across this huge chasm and looking at us from the other side. We are each standing on our own edges, clinging to our ideals, not just of what is good and necessary for our country, but of what is necessary to be a good and responsible person. The very principles in which goodness and decency and hope reside. We are standing on opposite cliffs of what should be done of who has been left behind and who needs the most help and who deserves the most. We are standing on opposite sides of what sacrifices should and need to be made of who are the oppressed and who are the disadvantaged and neglected. We are living in such a time that those who have been empowered will be dis empowered and those who were disempowered will now be empowered. We are living in such a time as this. May we find it within ourselves to understand that chasm, to understand why it exists and to understand why we didn't see it until now. And finally, when we do see it, that we will understand it with complete and utter clarity. So let us do what needs to be done and that which our hearts command us to do. Because we may not expect that our leaders will. So let us dedicate our tears. Let us dedicate our anger. Let us resist the comfort of easy answers and easier denials. Let us don a mantle of humility that makes us vulnerable, yes, but also of respect that makes us strong. Let us always seek to hear each other's voices and see others' pain and let us dream dreams for all of us. What can I say about that aspirational prayer? You know what, I still hold it in my heart, even knowing what I know now. I deliver that prayer the night before the inauguration and three days after the inauguration, and one day after the Women's March, 
I delivered a message to the new president gathered from me and others in our community. And here are some excerpts. As you can see, Mr. President, I said, we do not speak with one voice on your election. We offer many opinions, but it all boils down to the fact that we're saying two things. We give you a chance and you give us a chance. Some may say that the fact that Unitarian Universalists do not speak with one voice is a weakness, but we say it is our greatest strength and reflects the truth of our great nation. We are complex rather than simple, and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there are no easy solutions to the problems that plague us. I'm hoping that this election will teach us that we, all of us, need to listen to another, one another and understand what we need to cope with life as we have never listened before. I said, a wise man defined government for me this week. He said, government is our vehicle for collective action. It is not something separate from us, not apart from us or our collective well-being. It is the way in which we do the things that we cannot and should not do alone. Government is the means by which we protect ourselves from one another, from our, protect our country from attack, protect our economy from the imbalances of greed and protect the disadvantaged who are suffering. In the 20th century, we assumed responsibilities to other nations, forming alliances that whether they were through battle or economics or aid would strengthen their capacity for peace and prosperity and thereby our own as well. I also wrote the job of the person elected to be our president is huge. We know this. We also know the presidency is larger than the president. This person must don a mantle of responsibility, not just to the people who agree with him, but to the people who disagree. I also said, some think that we are meant to take care of ourselves. And some think that we are meant to take care of others. And some think that those two things are mutually exclusive while others think that they are not. We may never be united, but we hope and dream that we accept our diversity and try as hard as we can to make it work. What can I say about that sermon? Well, my intentions were good and I was hoping for the best. You see, I knew that we were not politically unified as a congregation. As a matter of fact, one of you told me with a wry grin that I can still remember seeing that their family had to take three cars to the polls, one for Trump, one for Clinton, and one for Sanders. So I didn't want the election to spark any further divisions between us. I also had this ideal that we could rely on the checks and balances of government and the golden protection of precedence and the courts and the norms of civil debates and civil disobedience. I was infatuated with those ideals and very, very presumptuous of privilege. I had no power, no voice in matters of state so why did I think it appropriate to act as if I did? And isn't that the definition of privilege? If that isn't the definition, I don't know what is. This year, the voting shoe is on the other foot. But I ask us to remember how we felt four years ago. Let the anguish of the voters who lost resonate with us. 
refrain from imagining that voters who lost in this election are dreaming for all of us. I'm not imagining that. Refrain from believing that the voters who lost the election four years ago have learned what they needed to learn from that loss. I am not testifying to that either. I do hope I know better now than I did four years ago, at least enough to know that I have a long way to go. Some think that we are meant to take care of ourselves and some think that we are meant to take care of others. We may never be united, but we can hope in green. Because we are still in the middle of a struggle for the soul of this country of ours. To hope, to pretend otherwise, is disingenuous at best and dangerous at worst. I just wanted to share with you some of my thoughts about democracy over the past four years. I want to share with you what I've been getting increasingly clear about, maybe even what are becoming non-negotiables for me. I love democracy, but when I look back throughout our history, it is very clear that the state is capable of great and severe injustice. I have been naive in thinking that, that the society that I live in is able, even after its long normative democratic processes, to rectify this. As long as we are living inside of the great lie of white superiority, and as long as we are living inside the great lie that others are acceptable sacrifices for our way of life, as long as we are living inside the great lie that our stewardship of the land and the climate is an acceptable sacrifice to our way of life, then we are still participating in a moral outrage that is continuing to weaken our nation and that cannot stand. I look at what's going on now, the controversies going on now, I looked at what happened to our legislators on January 6th, and I realized how very, very far apart and difficult this work is. I also realized that we cannot and should not expect our leaders to do this work alone. We are responsible for raising leaders who are capable of respecting diversity. And we have not been doing our jobs. When I listen to all the different points of view, I realize that those three things, remember that quote from Martin Luther King that I quoted last week about power and love and justice? I realize those three things need to be present together in equal measure always in any decision that affects our country. We have seen the results for generations when love is not present. And when we look forward, when we look forward to healing this country, our goals and our strategies, whatever, ever they may be, need to stand upon one value that we do our utmost to leave no one behind. 
if we are contemplating change, monumental change, then as a country, we need to accept fiscal and structural responsibility for the consequences so that we leave no one behind. So thinking back on that Christian intern, I say it is time that we be true to our faith to do the most unitarian and universalist thing that we have ever done. To have nothing in our purses and our pockets when we are confronted by people on opposite sides of that line, to have nothing there but our principles and our values. To be steady and relentless in this cause and to ask that the last be first and to leave no one behind. Thank you for listening.